Are we ready? <coughs> Thanks for uh, coming back after the coffee break. We had uh, two propositions, one uh, extended uh, overview of Jacqueline Turret's incredible uh, trajectory across the 20th century, uh, almost covering the entire uh, political economy of nation states and up to the moment of the transition into the uh, more uh, monetary politics of contemporary life uh, just after uh, her death. And uh, the uh, take on uh, uh, being minor of Keller uh, is uh, now giving way to uh, the proposition by Irit Rogov on bad judgment. Irit. First of all, apologies to the people who I'm sitting with my back to. Uh, I have nothing to show, and so this is just, it, it, it becomes a, a rude performance um, as a result. Um, the invitation to join this afternoon's discussion on Jacqueline Turret. Um, sort of resulted in a series of crises because um, up until reading Ellen Shoshka's uh, excellent book, I knew nothing about her. In fact, I'd never heard her name. And um, as I was reading it, I thought, well, probably the, the sort of, of way in which I should try and encounter it is through feminist theories of situated knowledge uh, primarily the work of Donna Haraway, which has been very influential work um, for me in thinking geography as a form of situated knowledge. But as I continued to read and think about it, I actually realized that I have um, somewhere far closer and more intimate to read um, this, this body of work from. And that has to do with having been born and raised in Israel and within the project of high Zionism, which defined the period in which I was growing up in Israel. And um, so it, that is what I've decided to sort of, of my way of thinking into this. Um, I've called this bad judgment. Now, Ellen, I don't know why I'm apologizing to you, um, the, the, as if you were the keeper of the memory of Jacqueline Turret, but um, I'm not accusing her of bad judgment. I'm sort of thinking of the extraordinary and sophisticated knowledges of modernism as resulting in endless cases of bad judgment. And so it's the relation between great and sophisticated bodies of knowledge and bad judgment that really interests me here. This, um, I've never actually sort of publicly spoken um, about Israel. It's a very difficult subject to talk about because one needs, one feels compelled to rehearse the endless denunciations which um, this as an operative nation state has, is, 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 are well deserved. And yet, and I think you've said this several times yesterday and today, denunciations are uniquely uninteresting and unproductive ways of operating. And so I think we'll assume a shared and collective um, sort of, of, of critical approach and not waste time on denunciations, um, et cetera. All I know about Jacqueline Tarrant, I know from reading Ellen Shoshkes' excellent work on her. While doing this reading, I thought I was encountering a figure who had exceptional intuitions and very bad judgment. And the exceptional intuitions have to do with the ability to recognize sort of emergent projects and their enormous importance. And the bad, ju bad judgment has to do with the inability to understand 
the degree to which throwing the, the unifying and homogenizing and universalizing mantle of modernism over absolutely everything results um, in catastrophic sort of, of byproducts. This bad judgment seems to me to be linked with the seductions of universalist impulses to plan absolutely everything in endless interconnective circuits. The encounter with Jacqueline Tirrett and her activities in the first half of the 20th century raises for me a series of questions regarding the exercise of judgment within a modernist paradigm. Even more specifically, whether the modernist ethos actually allows for the exercise of judgment, of differentiation, of withdrawal, or does it override such a possibility through the compulsion to relentlessly move forward and improve? Would not the position of a gendered singularity, seemingly the only woman in the circle of endless male architects and planners, and coming from landscape architecture, which had traditionally been the line of flight for women in that field, should not that have produced a situated knowledge from which to be critical? We have all read the work of Jean-Francois Lyotard, and we all know the pitfalls of totalizing ideologies and of legitimating narratives of what Lyotard calls the denotative performative in which the answer always already shapes the question. Tirwit was clearly of her time, and the influence of Patrick Geddes's work, which seems so arrogant from today's perspective on neotechnics. To Geddes, ideas around neotechnics and the capacity for reshaping the natural world, which seemed to have been to dominated Tirwit's belief system during her days as a planner and organizer. To that, I would wish to bring Foucault's thoughts on technology, not as an ethics neutral set of artifacts by which we can exercise power over nature, but, quote, as a set of structured forms of action by which we also inevitably exercise power over ourselves. And so the, the one of the aspects um, of the bad judgment of modernism has been to exclude the shaped self out of the equation. So governance is always governance external to the self and never kind of, of radiating backwards and shaping the self. But I will try and find a different point of entry into this problematic namely that of the Zionist project, of which I know a great deal, having been raised in it. It is difficult to even, to even approach the subject. The brutal injustices that have been enacted in the name of Zionism, the world-leading technologies being tried out by every country in the world, having been experimented on by Palestinians, by the Israeli armed forces, the development of ever more advanced algorithms which lend themselves to a host of civilian economies, creating seamless paths between what is generated by the military and what becomes an opportunistic, a set of digit, opportunistic digital protocols. Recognizing that the state's considerable economic health rests on high-tech industries that emerge straight from the military intelligence machine. This week's election in Israel have made clear that hatred and fear override any other mode of reflection within what, within what has become de facto an apartheid state of absolute hopelessness under the guise of advanced modern technological society. So you can imagine that coming from there, from a high Zionist family that built the country having been indoctrinated by these complex ideologies, having liberated oneself into post-colonial discourse as a way of having some critical tools by which to examine the situation. You can imagine how uneasy this is for me. 
But the more I read of the life of Jacqueline Terwitt, the more I realize that I actually have a very different place from which to know all this and to think about modernism's instances of bad judgment. Now, Zionism as a movement preceded the founding of the State of Israel by some 60 years. And I think increasingly needs to be characterized as an instance of modernist madness. What I call modernist madness was the impulse to rip everything out of its complex local, local contexts, the empires and colonizations and occupations in myriad mixed populations, the bureaucracies that created mandates and free international cities, and the legacies of old agrarian societies, and the endlessly overwritten border lines of the region. With one unified and seamless historical narrative, in order to put into effect what is one of the greatest land grabs in history, there was also the necessity to own every aspect of the knowledge of that land. So one, one of the things that um, I think become, become sort of very interesting for me is to recast what is normally seen as a territorial conflict as the legacy of a colossal modernist project of knowledge production. So to, to sort of, of um, try and think not about opposing territorial claims, not about ethnic warfares, not about a whole set of, of ways by which the, the, um, the Arab-Israeli conflict has been characterized, but as the legacy of this truly colossal project of knowledge production. And um, the, the exceptional intellectual resources of the Jewish diaspora in Berlin, Warsaw, Vilnius, Moscow, the greatest intellectual centers of Jewish knowledge were mobilized for a gigantic exercise in totalizing ownership. The language, Hebrew, which had been the language of prayer for several thousand years, was renewed and dictionaries were produced to bring it into the 20th century. In addition to linguistics, geology, geography, botany, zoology, archeology, span art and design, architecture, etc., etc., and many others, were roped into this mad project of total invention and renewal. All plants and all animals were reclassified and given new Hebrew names. Geological stratas and geographical landscapes and formation were renamed and reclassified and endless archeological digs delivered the artifacts that substantiated the historical arguments. This is ours, we have always been here. Our knowledge of the place is superior. We're the only ones who know how to bring it into the 20th century, to build it into the new modernist idiom, and that legitimates our ownership. A new language for knowledge was perpetuated. All local and colloquial indigenous knowledge is dismissed. Odd categories were invented. Um, a friend of mine, um, an Israeli artist called Reli de Fries, um, who is a um, geologist and a landscape architect by training and, and sort of, of um, daily, um, daily practice, um, has had a series of quite remarkable projects that explored this from um, slightly oblique points of entry. Uh, and one in particular, I thought, kind of, of illuminated this. In the colossal uh, project of reclassifying all the fauna and flora of the region um, and giving it new names and organizing it into new families. So in a way, sort of, of, of 
dispensing with several hundred years of botanical knowledge that produced certain kinds of coalition between plants and thinking of it purely in terms of its relation to the land. So she started working on a plant um, that is very central to the Palestinian kitchen and is called in Arabic the akub. Um, the, the, in Hebrew, it was given um, a, a sort of very modernist new name, akuvita galgal, and classified into the family of bad plants. And the reason that it was classified into the family of bad plants is that um, this is a plant that is uh, racinated at the beginning of its cycle. But once it begins to bear fruit, it deracinates itself and begins to act like a tumbleweed. So it, it's sort of that. So it cannot be kept within boundaries. It does not adhere to the borders of the state. It goes wherever it wants. And um, it is a very major staple of the Palestinian kitchen. And so she did a very sort of, of, of uh, complex research body on this plant and, um, and, and sort of produced an exhibition project called the Akub and the Company of Bad Plants, in which what she tried to, to sort of, of play out was the degree to which a good plant was a plant that could be domesticated, whereas a bad plant was a plant that refused all forms of domestication. And she brought a great many sort of, of materials into this, this project. And one of them was um, a small news clip from one of the local news channels in which um, something called the Green Patrol, which is a some semi-official military of plants um, that basically drives around in green jeeps wearing jean uniforms authorized by the, the, the Ministry of Agriculture and tries to uh, maintain the legality and, and um, activities of, of conservation of certain kinds of, of plants. So the, the clip was about 20 seconds of these green uniformed patrols running across the hills of Judea in, in the wake of a bunch of Palestinian housewives in kind of, of, of local dress and yelling at them without any sense of irony whatsoever, go home. And there was, there was something about the enactment um, of this situation, which um, I thought I thought sort of, of brought full circle the kind of bad judgment of which I am talking. It's bad judgment not only in terms of the actions that you pursue, but it's bad judgment that assumes that a superior body of knowledge authorizes your actions. A new language for knowledge was perpetuated. All local and colloquial indigenous knowledges dismissed. Odd categories were invented. The, the, one of the, the most interesting case studies of which I was, I was um, recently a witness is the story of the home, the original home of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem on Mount Scopus. So the, the um, original campus of the university was built in the 30s. Now, it is an instance of what I'm talking about as a modernist madness, that in every case that you investigate in relation to what is Israel today, institutions of knowledge precede the state. So the, the university preceded the state by almost 20 years. Um, the, the, um, the dictionary projects, the, the research projects, the libraries, the great collections, they all precede the state because it is they that the state is founded on and not the land, right? It is legitimated by a body of, of research. And one has to kind of, of think the situation. There are people in the 1920s and 1930s, Zionists, 
arriving from the sort of, of great European centers of avant-garde practices and research. And they are adapting those knowledges all the time in a very fluid way to a, a Zionist dream, which is about the, the combination of a notion of social justice in which the, the sort of, of the conditions of the workers are paramount with the bodies of most sophisticated knowledge in the world at the same time. And this is a paradox that is almost impossible to think today. The, the sort of the notion that one is dealing with the adaptation of, you know, Fisher nuclear physics from Berlin in the late 1920s with how to grow oranges in a marsh um, at, at, at the same time. And that everything is subjugated to a kind of, of, of political program. And of course, you know, when, when you think about it, there is the, the, the project of fascism in Germany is not an unsimilar project. But it's not a project which um, has at its heart this kind of socialist fantasy of the, the conditions of, of people's life. And it's not a project that has at its heart some illusion about the ability to produce a corrective for, for history. So Mount Scopus was um, designed and built largely by Erich Mendelssohn, who was um, a, a very major um, architect um, in the Berlin, in Berlin, and the um, and John has has told me that Patrick Geddes was the master planner of the city of Tel Aviv, which was founded in in 1905 and which began its kind of of very large scale building in the 1920s, and um, which kind of of tied uh, to it together in, in into into this uh, this kind of set of questions. So Scopus um, was, was built on a completely um, desert-like, um, it's, a, it's a sort of high hill overlooking the old city of, of Jerusalem. The land was acquired from a series of, of, of uh, local owners. And the, the campus was built in a mixed idiom of high Bauhaus modernism and a certain kind of orientalism which has almost nothing to do with the local architectural idiom, indigenous architectural idiom. It's a Berlin fantasy um, of, of orientalism. I recently was part of a quite amazing project at the Hebrew University in which um, a, it's coming from the music department where they got an enormous grant to think about how to know a place through a whole series of, of different entry points, but not um, its, its kind of, of geographical and material coordinates. And um, one of the things that um, they were doing in, within this project was um, they were building sonic landscapes of all the ambient sounds that converge within this kind of high modernist ed edifice. But somebody also did extraordinary archival work and came up with photographs by a German photographer from Berlin who had emigrated to Palestine in the late 1920s and who was photographing these Mendelssohn buildings on a completely empty, treeless, almost desert-like landscape, and Mount Scopus overlooks the Judean desert. He was photographing them in the way in which you would photograph urban architecture in a major European city. He was urbanizing the landscape through his photographs. And it is that application of a whole host of sophisticated knowledges and technologies projected on to a, a sort of, of, of space and onto the illusion of a, an empty space. Because of course, that illusion had to be in place in order to be able to produce these kinds of, of fanciful uh, projections. 
that makes it, I think, operate as a modernist madness. And it is the belief in knowledge, in planning, in technology, in hygiene, that produces um, a, a sort of, of, of foundation of, of security. And as many of you might know, this week there were elections in Israel and an extreme right-wing government led by Netanyahu has been brought into power for the fourth time running. This is the longest serving government that the state has ever had. And anyone looking at this from the outside begins to ask oneself, how is this possible? How is it possible to defy reality to that extent and for that long? That to be ostracized by almost every nation in the world to have the facts fully known to one, and yet to continue in this stubborn way to cling to a set of beliefs that have been disproven by reality again and again and again. And I would venture to say that the sort of colossal project of Zionist knowledge production in every facet um, of, of the building of the state is what enables a kind of delusional political landscape in which it is possible to defy reality. And it is not the fear of threat, and it is not a sort of, of uh, clinging to, to territorial claims, and it is not questions of security. Because when you know the region, you know that the, the sort of question of security is, is a red herring um, in, in terms of who has the military power, who has the, the support of, of um, shields against missiles, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the sort of, of, it seems increasingly necessary to understand modernist madnesses which produce vast bodies of sophisticated knowledge and underwrite truly delusional political projects as something which, as, as the flip side of, 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 you know, of, of the modernist sort of idealistic um, ethos. Zionism is an instance of the bad judgment of modernism. So to come back to the earlier question, I would wish to bring Foucault's thoughts on technology as not an ethics neutral set of artifacts by which we can exercise power over nature, but as a set of structured forms of action by which we also inevitably exercise power over ourselves. It is the question of modernism's power over us rather than over the world that I am preoccupied with here. Thank you. I apologize for, for really such an eccentric um, point of entry into the problematic, but... Um, I have a question. Um, we've, we tend to somehow singularize the modernist ethos very quickly, as much as the modernists tend to singularize and unify nature. And I wonder if... Uh, the figure of Territ, which is, well, has managed to escape that singularization, uh, is somehow, in unexpected ways, opening up spaces of differentiation within that process. Because no matter what, even the Zionists, the, the colonizers, the uh, social nationalists, were quarreling, yeah. were quarreling among themselves about how to do things. They were not somehow unifying their projects. They, uh, mm -hmm. There were many different elements in it. And I think that to start questioning the uh, project as you've done so uh, poignantly of uh, modernism and knowledge production as a way of conquering the world and um, making somehow the world meet our demands of almost make the world into our idea rather than make our idea fit the world. It could be 
could start being somehow undone mm -hmm. in the fact that the, the modern dream somehow was a little bit less uh, unified mm -hmm. in spite of its violence than many other contemporary dreams well, I, I of think, utopian. I think that there's, there's a really interesting history that needs to be sketched in a non-idealistic way of the relation between different moments of modernism to tragedy. Because it, it, it seems to me that there are repeated moments in which modernism emerges, not simply as a kind of idealistic utopian set of, of ideal con conditions for you know, a better, modern, more, more, more uh, technologized life, but as a panacea for tragedy. So after the First World War, after the Second World War, um, in response to, to um, great waves of racism and genocide, again and again, modernism emerges as a panacea. And it emerges as a panacea not just through the, the instrument of being able to build better conditions, but um, in, in the way in which you can instrumentalize knowledge for humanity. Right. So it's, it's really, I, I'm not at, at this stage all that interested in the artifacts of modernism, although I was, you know, for, for a while. Um, so the buildings and, and the highways and the, the, the sort of, of, of um, infrastructures that, that modernists thought made possible. But I am, I am very interested in the power of its knowledge production platforms and the way in which they keep being taken up. Um, we, we talked on previous occasions about these sort of, of groups of scientists in the 1960s who begin to form all these associations and clubs which are meant to, to ref, for scientists to reflect about the, the sort of bad judgment of their practice, the horrific consequences you know, of what they've been doing. But then to use that superiorly informed reflection in order to make the world better. So Not to repent, but to make the world better. And, and, and that really it sort of, of interests me. And I think it has, there are certain moments in the history of the United Nations and its agencies which start from that, but then almost immediately become these vast bureaucratic technologies that you know, are, are, are absolutely sort of, of um, immune to any form of, of, of self-reflectiveness. So I thought when, when you said that Tirwit wouldn't have been able to work within these structures, I thought I understood exactly why. Because the, the moment of their nascence is a very reflective moment, but they almost immediately become these kind of world enveloping bureaucracies and technocracies. Are there questions? Are there immediate questions? Well, I have many. Alan has a question. <coughs> um, I would like to ask in the question in terms of what you were saying, platforms of uh, knowledge production, and also to the preoccupation um, that you were speaking about before to education, right? And I think, and not education so much, I would, wouldn't like to define it so much as like a building up education platforms, which this of course was part of the Zionist project and is part of, I guess, acquiring any state of knowledge, but really how would you think you read um, of the Zionist project as a pedagogical, uh, like the planning of the Zionist project as a pedagogical project as well? And also John, maybe you could jump in on that in in the point of Geddes and uh, his, uh, because I know you've been doing a bit of research on that and planning Tel Aviv, how, if was there any a pedagogical notion in that or any pedagogical approach or is it something we could start um, like unfolding or tackling in a way? Maybe I take on uh, from that um, in order to somehow not just focus this take only on one instance of modern planning, because what you're dealing with is the multiplication of this and uh, the incredible uh, 
capacity of this way of conceiving of uh, the role of intellectuals in the entire planet. It really spreads out like a sandstorm very quickly. There's in the introduction to the biography of Patrick Geddes by Louis Mumford, a very interesting start where he says, some people consider Geddes on the same level as Aristoteles. Other people have never heard of him. And what is interesting is that he almost never wrote. And even if he did write, nobody understood his language. But what he did was to teach, exactly like Plato did teach and did not write. Mm -hmm. And so he, in the very first page of his biography, Louis Mumford places this very strange contradiction be between not being traced by the instruments of academia, of modern academia, and being a teacher in that particular condition. I think that is uh, really at the core of uh, the discussion that we're having here today. And that fragility of that position is, to me, really interesting. The work of uh, Turret, if it does one thing, and uh, Ellen's book is really uh, a testimony to that, it shows an infinite attempt to not put down everything just in paper, but to teach life. Uh, at the center of all of this, there's an idealization, and I would say a unification of the notion of life. So her work was really also so much about organizing uh, the acoustic uh, society. That meant bringing together people from all kinds of places, from India, from the non-aligned countries of uh, Indonesia, from Cuba, from Russia, to Athens, to somehow inquire into possible ways of pursuing a betterment of the world through the, her notion of the core of cities. You know? And I think that particular aspect uh, is what really fascinates me in Ellen's uh, book, that she somehow passes through the 20th century and brings with her the idea of the core of the city from Geddes onto her experiments in India and further on in acoustics, but at the center of the city, there is a social space. And that social space is a space of teaching. And civility. And that's exactly where the difficult element resides uh, in, uh, mm -hmm. after your take on modernism as a gigantic, colossal knowledge production project. There you have small civic spaces with a school, a kindergarten, a little thing that suddenly is multiplying that worldview all around the world. But it's, it's, it's what one understands as civility. I mean, I, I'm, I was very interested in the fact that the theater, the opera, the libraries, the universities, the education system, all of this precedes the state and the cafes for gathering. And, and they're the core of social and, life. And they, and they are the core, but they're also, and this is something that was probably true in, in, in the sort of Soviet era. They're also a narrative in which the state is poor, has nothing. It really is very poor, but unbelievably rich in knowledge and therefore extremely sophisticated. And so the, the sort of, of Poverty is not in any way a, a, a sort of drawback or a hindrance to development. Right? Development is not based in resources, it's based in knowledge. And the, the, there's a very interesting architect and, and um, architectural historian called Svia Frat, who we've met, and he did an, a, a really groundbreaking exhibition called To Build a Country, and um, sort of, of showed um, this was about the Zionist project of building the state at the level of buildings. And what he showed was the interconnection between every detail and every detail. So, of course, the buildings and the roads and the public spaces, but the utility furniture and the, the textiles. And, and sort of, there's not an element 
of, it's designed for living, but it's divine, designed for living not in terms of aesthetics, not in terms of a better life, but in order to make one functional within the kind of, 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 of Zionist project. And so, and I think, I mean, to me it's become, it's become imperative to move away from the product because the, the sort of, of there's a, a little book that I found in my father's library from 1936, which is one of the main sort of intellectuals of the moment. Um, writing a tirade about the opening of the Hebrew University. Is this university going to be the repository of Jewish life around the world? This is 36, so it's before the Holocaust, it's before the genocide of European Jewry. Is it going to be a repository for all Jewish knowledges around the world in, in sort of all the centers? Or is it going to be a machine for the advancement of the Zionist cause and the building of the State of Israel? And it's there. It's there in the form of a polemic in 1936. And these are, are sort of, of, of extremely interesting, I think, modes by which to enter an understanding of what I think of as the bad judgment of modernism. tries to masquerade itself as a, uh, as a background. There is conflicts that are nevertheless overruled. They are you know, taken over by the, what I would call the unifying uh, attitude. And I, I'm it's interested in that. Dynamic. It's always in play. Yes, I, I don't think it. Now is not going to be in power forever. No, I would say, but on the contrary, I would argue that the distinction, the continuity of the distinction between, say, technologies and society, between artifacts and society. That constant idea, ah, look, it is a great project, but it's just a fleeting, it's a transient project, and now it doesn't really work. But look, some part of it are good, and maybe they come back. And at the core of that is always a distinction between, say, ideas and things, between uh, production and uh, the consequences of that production. And I'm trying to uh, maybe articulate a posi possibility of bringing those two back together, which is what I understand is happening in the circuits of those people really inquiring into the Anthropocene, where figure ground start being you know, very, uh, in, in very complex relations where the cause and effects are not so clear. Somehow the effects come much earlier than the causes. So we discover now that we are in the Anthropocene, but it happened much earlier. So, and now we have to act on something that has already happened. So the, it inverses the political conditions of what it is. And I wonder whether that circularity was ever at the heart of uh, thoughts of uh, people like Gettys or Turret or even Doxiadis and you know, 
the master of circular relation, uh, Buckminster Fuller, who uh, Turret so uh, closely collaborated with. It just seems that it's, it's crucial that we sort of are able to have a split screen of being able to see the script and then also see the, what the organization is actually doing to see you know, what the disposition of the organization at the same time that you see the script and you see the discrepancy between those two, those two things. that isn't understandable otherwise. Yeah, it just, yeah. It's not comprehensible. But, the, but that's part of it. And, but part of it is that it's a melange of modernisms. It's not one modernism. Right. It's, it's, a, a mel it's an absolute melange of every modernism under the sun. And um, kind of, of yoke together to, to sort of say, this is not just the opportunity for for a superior life, but it's a justification, mm -hmm. right? So it's a legitimating narrative. But it comes from Central Europe and Eastern Europe and, and um, the United States, and it's, it's, it's from everywhere. The melange that, that is a, a melange of universals, a melange of monisms, um, I, I make that plural. Um, interested in the idea of knowledge production by architects. Most of what we saw in Ellen's uh, um, uh, presentation, beautiful presentation, was mostly maps and charts and data. Uh, we never saw images of people uh, engaged in some sort of activity on the ground. Um, so I think that that's very interesting to me, especially in relation to your discussion about knowledge production. Because today, we know that architects Architectural historians are not afraid of showing like a bunch of urban farmers uh, working in Detroit in order to revitalize life over there. But it seems to me that at that time period, the idea was to look at everything from above and visualizing everything in, in some sort of abstract way. But there was one point in your presentation, Ellen, which, which I found really intriguing. You talked about this um, essay written by Jacqueline called different ways of seeing, uh, if I am correct on that, different modes of seeing that is very um, Indian oriented, different from uh, the Renaissance idea of linear perspective. It was an essay she wrote called The Moving, uh, moving, the moving Eye, and it was published in the Exploration Oh, Journal. The Moving Eye, yes. So what is, can you elaborate a little bit on The Moving Eye? Is it a different project than the project of modernity? It's like, kind of like, you know, Geddes' idea of looking at everything from a bird's um, eye view? Well, with all due respect, <laughs> I, I disagree that uh, Geddes, let's say, viewed everything from above. I mean, he was a botanist a naturalist, a biologist. I mean, he, he saw things as organic living holes. I don't think that he was an objectifying 
abstracting type of a guy, you know, yes, in some ways. And in the use of the maps and um, the trying to visualize the social data, that also came from, I mean, a, yes, a, a universalizing um, um, impulse, but the idea was to make information clear and understandable. So to take complex information about social groups or dynamics and to try to explain it in a way visually, through visual communication, so that people who didn't understand as a highly technical language would be able to adequately, visually, at grasp, you know, grasp these complex ideas. So it was coming from a very, um, um, a strong impulse of, of wanting to empower people, all people, to have this kind of knowledge. And using these uh, visual techniques was, they were experimenting with them. They were saying, let's see if this works, right? But the, the moving eye is exactly what you're talking about, is, is whole exploring, people who were exploring at that time, ways of breaking out from what they perceived as the, the psychologically restriction, restricting notions of, of a fixed perspective that somehow you know, our ways of seeing being determined by, um, well, culturally determined, and how changes in our culture were freeing um, our ability to see up, to see things in, in, in more fluid ways, and how architects could, could study that and pay attention to that and start designing in that way, not to be constrained by designs, you know, um, formulas that were grounded in earlier cultural frameworks, you know, what physics said. It's like, okay, so we want to be more fluid. We want, we want to be able to see spaces as, as changing, constantly changing based on our perspective. And how do we do that? That maybe brings us to Kepesh. And through Kepesh to the Minas and Nomeda, uh, who somehow inhabit the remnants of that project in uh, the very institution uh, set up by Kepesh in order to pursue the dynamic vision. And they, the two of you inhabit that position, but from a, a tangent point of view. It's uh, extremely uh, useful for us to somehow be friends with you because we learn so much of what it means to somehow be next to that heritage and still you know, be able to spin off from it. And uh, I am really looking forward to uh, this presentation because your trajectory through all of this comes really from afar. And so, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anne-Sophie, John, uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. And, and thank you, Alan and Keller and Irit, for your uh, stellar presentations. Um, of course, our host did an amazing job scripting and uh, Organizing this discursive event, so uh, so for us it's really uh, it's really an honor to uh, to segue you know to something that we kind of like you know trying to describe as the you know, like humanist dimension you know, or something that's that Kepesh himself was calling towards civic art. Um, so in the first part of our presentation, we will chart the context conditioning CABS Center for Advanced Visual Studies and the techno-social context that brought together architects, scientists, and engineers to think through art. Such adoption of systems that encourage ways of thinking together with other fields, it is something that could be called cohabitation. In the second part of the presentation, we will chart an archival river case and our response to it through the River Runs project. CVS found a Kepesh saw a pedagogical role of the river in conditioning spontaneous social interaction and thus facilitating uh, 
what he called a citizenship of the environment and the notion of the civic that emerges in the context of Cold War confrontation that perhaps links Tirbit and Kapish. In this presentation, we will quote Judith Wexler, professor at HTC, who was working in the 70s at MIT, Department of Architecture. Alice Supertis, former researcher at CVS and now curator of the public art collections at the list. Also, my students, Scott Brzezowski and Gina Badger, who helped us uh, uh, since 2009 when we landed at MIT. Perhaps as all immigrants transcending the threshold from one language into another, we had to dive into that liminal space of being enrooted and translate ourselves from one state and cultural context into another. And this is the reading why I am reading. Uh, as, uh, as to enter the space in the real time for all immigrants, is, uh, it is a difficulty. Uh, the work that we had done before coming to MIT dealt with questions pertinent to spaces and transitions specific to countries and regimes that undergo rapid political and economic changes. This urged us to look at the expanded definitions of civic space. This is a question how to situate discourse of civic space in the larger discourse of the environment. Researching the role of technology plays in modernization of the culture, and especially during the Cold War confrontation, as formative to the discussion of public space and environment, we arrived on the spot at MIT with the access to the archives that chart the first programmatic attempts within the visual arts to engage with the emerging ecological crisis. In 67, Kapish, a Hungarian-born artist who had come to the United States with Laszlo Mohodinagy, to teach at about Neubhaus in Chicago, founded the CAVS. Central to the debates at CAVS was the role that new technologies could play to mitigate the hazards of industrialization and develop a more sustainable human environment. The name chosen for the center is of particular significance. Once again, Kepesh demonstrated his interest in vision and in visual language the cornerstone in his eyes of collaborative engagement between artists and scientists and architects. In this published proposal, in the published proposal he writes, vision is a fundamental factor in human insight. It is our most important resource for shaping our physical, spatial environment and grasping the new aspect of nature revealed by modern science. Echoing Moholy Naji, Kepesh continues, Artists are living seismographs, as it were, with a special and direct sensitivity to the human condition. The immediate and direct response to the sensuous qualities of the world helps us to establish an entente with the living presence. Attempting to reacquaint artists with what he understood as a social role of artistic image, helping the public at large to adjust the to the tremendous changes in scale and magnitude brought about by scientific and technological advances of the 20th century, Kepesh focused CVS on the three areas in particular. Creative use of light, the new aspects of environmental art, the gearing of sculptural and pictorial tasks, the dynamic scale of urban environment, and to the new wealth of technical tools and implements, and the third, the role of the visual science in artistic communication, an investigation that could branch out in creative exploration of subjective icons, as well as the common visual symbols in the cityscape and the scientific exploration of communication and the use of graphic science for the didactic purposes. In 72, Kepesh edited an ontology entitled Arts of the Environment, featuring contributions by an interdisciplinary range of theorists and practitioners the book presents one of the first programmatic attempts within a visual arts to engage with the emerging ecological crisis. We take arts of the environment as the point of departure to examine the debates that took place in early 70s as art and design encounter with destructive forces of a completely new kind, a man-generated, cumulative, and of, ultimo, and of almost cosmic proportion. Central to these debates, especially within the context of CAVS, was the role that new technologies could play to mitigate the hazards of industrialization and develop a more sustainable human environment. 
informed by cybernetic discourse of self-regulation, feedback loops, and homeostasis, advocates of art and technology such as Kepesh saw the potential for artists to collaborate with scientists and engineers to create what he called ecological feedback machines that sense our danger and work towards resolving the problem of man's relation with his surroundings. At the same time, many critics of the left were becoming increasingly skeptical of techno-scientific advances, which they saw as inextricably tied to the post-war military-industrial complex and therefore complicit within the ongoing war in Vietnam. Some also had doubts about the politics of the environment, environment crusade that had been launched by politicians and the mass media in the summer 69. As Leo Marx observed in his contribution to Arts of the Environment, the crusade was nicely timed to deflect student attention from the disruptive political issues of the 60s. In an essay entitled Art and Ecological Consciousness, which was published in the, as the introduction of, to arts of the environment, Kepesh writes, the human body has an inbuilt self-defense psychological mechanism that protects it from extreme imbalance. We have begun to see that our extended body, our social and man transformed environment, must develop its own self-regulating mechanisms to eliminate the poisons injected into it and recycle useful matter. Environmental homeostasis on a global scale is now necessary for survival. Creative imagination, artistic sensibility can be seen as one of our basic collective self-regulating devices. By the late 60s, this understanding of the planet as an extended body had become common. In his article, Where is the Environment, from, 60, from 76, Kenneth Bar Baker suggests us to look at the first photographs of the entire planet Earth in space taken by the Apollo astronauts. These pictures that, that are enmeshed in the history of photography in their souvenir and propaganda value tell us, since their point of view is literally extra extraterrestrial, that they were taken from the standpoint constructed remotely by the human, American, know-how. In other words, these images bespeak the ultimate capability of constructing another world, a world that could be known completely being the product of human knowledge and perhaps controlled completely. The same year, Buckminster Fuller published his operating manual for Spaceship Earth. And critic Jack Burham, who was a CVS fellow at the time, wrote in an essay called Real-Time Systems. We are beginning to accept the Earth and its guests as total organism with its own metabolism. This recalls the Greek etymology of ecology, oikos house, or the science of the home. The conception of the planet as a system of population, resource, and pollution flows also underpinned in the work of Jay Forrester, who contributed an article on system dynamics to the arts of the environment. Forrester, a computer engineer and professor at MIT Sloan School of Business and Management, had developed a computer-based world model that served on as the basis of the Club of Rome reports, Limits to Growth, also published in 72. The report controversially announced the mat mathematical unsustainability of the post-war vision of infinite industrial expansion. But Forrester's diagram also epitomized a kind of technocratic project that sets up a world picture to be monitored and managed by experts. This world model uh, from Limits of Growth was uh, published a couple of years ago in Guardian, uh, who wrote, models and reality are not the same thing, but strikingly given the relatively crude computer modeling available at the time, the MIT projections have proved remarkably accurate. Today, they can be checked against the case of actual data. Population, industrial output, pollution, and food consumption all track these, the lines in the model. Awareness of environmental devastation had been growing in U.S. since 62, when Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, inspiring widespread public concern over the use of pesticides and eventually leading to the banning of DDT. 72 was also a year of the first United Nations Conference on the Human Environment in Stockholm. The meeting agreed upon declaration containing 26 principles concerning the environment and development among those 
Among those were uh, human rights that must be asserted, natural resources must be safeguarded, earth capacity to produce renewable resources must be maintained, wildlife must be safeguarded, non-renewable resources must be shared and not exhausted, pollution must not exceed environment's capacity to clean itself, and damaging oceanic pollution must be prevented. In 1970, Nixon celebrated the first Earth Day, signed the Clean Air Act, and established an Environmental Protection Agency. But as Herbert Marcuse observed, dissent or protest in America could be easily liquidated through wholesale incorporation into the established order, through their reproduction and display on the massive scale. In 1970, a group of French theorists, including Jean Baudrillard, were invited to participate in the International Design Conference in Aspen, where they delivered a statement called Environmental Witch Hunt. The real issue is not the survival of human species, but the survival of political power. In the mystic of environment, this blackmail towards apocalypse and toward a myth mythic enemy who is in us, and all around tends to create a false interdependence among individuals. Nothing better than a touch of ecology and catastrophe to unite the social classes. The environment was on the minds of many artists as well. Um, 69 Earth Art Exhibition in Cornell, Ant Farm, Air Emergency, you see Berkeley Campus, the first of the 70. Gordon Mata Clark, Fresh Air Card 72, Hans Hockes, Rhine Water Purification Plant, Christon Jean Claude, Running Fence, and Smithson's King Kong Meets the Germ of Egypt. From the constructivist to Bauhaus, collaborations between artists and industry were nothing new in the history of modernism. But the 60s saw an explosion of such initiatives. In 1959, the British author, physicist, and educator, Snow, delivered his famous lecture, The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution, calling for the urgent need to overcome the divide that separates the sciences from the humanities and Western educational life. The increasing industrialization of post-war culture, Snow argued, demanded a humanizing influence of the liberal arts. In many ways, Snow's speech anticipated the phenomenon of interdisciplinarity within academia and its spirit seemed to inspire many of the art and technology collaborations that would soon follow. In 66, Billy Kluver, Swedish engineer, partnered with Robert Rauschenberg, Reiner, Cage, and others to form experiments in art and technology. In 67, uh, Kepesh founded CBS. The era also saw a number of high-profile exhibitions dedicated to art and technology, including Cybernetic Serendipity at ICA London, Software at the Jewish Museum, 70, uh, Information at the MoMA, 1970, Art as Seen at the End of Mechanical Age at MoMA the following year, also it participated in 70 in Osaka, Japan, gaining international attention with its spectacular pavilion. But the early 70s optimism many artists and critics had for art and technology started to shift toward an attitude of suspicion. The Vietnam War dramatically undermined public confidence in the promise of new technology, linking it with corporate support of the war. This conflict of interest was exemplified by the exhibition of art and technology program of the LA County Museum of Art organized by Maurice Dutchman in 71. The program, which had been launched in 66, placed over 20 artists in residency at some 37 sponsoring corporations in Southern California, including IBM, Lockheed Aircraft, Rand Corporation, Rockwell, and 20th Century Fox. Even Jack Burham, who had created Software Jewish Museum, the previous year criticized the exorbitant cost of the project in Art Forum review entitled Corporate Art. In another review in the same issue entitled The Multi-Million Dollar Art uh, Boondoggle, the critic Mark, Max Kozlov wrote, they accused the May Lai massacre, the Chicago Democratic Convention riots, the assassination of 
Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, the invasion to Cambodia and the student killings at Kent and Jackson State, while these convulsions were taking place, inflaming the radicalism of our youth and polarizing the country, the American artist didn't hesitate to freeload at the through of that techno-fascism that had inspired them. One of the most significant projects realized by CVS was Explorations. Originally planned as the 69 American contribution to the 10th Sao Paulo Biennale, the show ultimately appeared in slightly different form at the Smithsonian Institution National Collection of Fine Arts in the spring of 1970. As the organizer of the American contribution to the Sao Paulo Biennale, Kepesh devised an artistic unit that conveyed this, his thinking about the relationship of art to society. According to Kepesh, the show was not designed as an anthology of individual artworks, but to create a synergetic system wherein each work has an interaction, like the dream of human community, not just kinetically, but with every relationship interdependent. Yet ironically, in view of the degree to which Kepesh owns belief, in importance of the relationship of the art and society, a number of artists withdrew to protest both the, Viet the American war in Vietnam and the activities of the Brazilian government. With the first moonwalk imminent, the exhibition in Brazil of works that feature a significant technological influence seemed particularly in inappropriate to Robert Smithson. Smithson came to feel, as he explained in a letter to Kepesh, that to present an exhibition that feature it, that to present an exhibition that feature it a purely celebratory view of technology was to fail to acknowledge its dangers in a meaningful way. I am withdrawing from the show because it promises nothing but a distraction amid the general nausea. If technology is to have any chance at all, it must become more self-critical. If one wants teamwork, he should join the army. The panel called What's Wrong with Technological Art might help. The problem that Kepesh encountered throughout his tenure at MIT in, and in his establishment of the center at MIT is, is an important one. How to make a vision formulated in the first half of the 20th century relevant for successive generations of artists. As he observed, public interest in the relationship between art and technology blossomed during the 60s, producing a new cultural climate of receptivity toward the projects he advocated. This resurgent interest on the, on the part of artists and the public in the relationship of art to science and technology resulted largely from the cultural Cold War launched by Sputnik. In the United States, as the importance of science and technology was stressed in schools and as, and as the country raised the Soviet Union to the moon, technology promised to have a huge impact on daily life. The growing awareness of the ubiquity of technological tools of the new technological tools and materials that resulted inevitably stim stimulated a renewed interest in the intersection between art and technology. In this atmosphere, Kepesh's theories reached a new audience. With his adamant rejection in the early and mid-60s of a host of 20th century art movements that didn't seem to fulfill his demand for social engagement, Kepesh very likely caused himself valuable alliances. However, with the birth of the environmental art movement in the late 60s and the widespread interest in systems theory among artists and architects, Kepesh found a way to make his vision meaningful for a new generation. Well, I have quite, quite many pages. I just realized, you know, so how much, how much time do we have? Okay, so, uh, thank you, John. Um, an example of Cold War interdisciplinarity at MIT can be found in the research lab of electronics, the post-war continuance of MIT's radiation lab, best known for its numerous wartime advances in radar technologies. The RLE, funded by military contract, assembled mathematicians, engineers, and scientists to research topics such as microwave electronics, guided missiles, and secure communications. The RLE has been presented as a pioneering structure for the practice of interdisciplinarity as supplement to the production of depart departmentally produced knowledge at MIT. 
The following are the reflections of Julius Straton, RLE director in 46 and later MIT president. The founding of the RLE in 46 represented a major new departure in the organization of academic research at MIT and was destined to influence the development of interdepartmental centers at the Institute over the next two decades. These centers have been designed to supplement rather than, rather than to replace the traditional departmental structure. They take account on the fact that newly emerging fields of science commonly cut across the conventional disciplinary boundaries. Perhaps more than any other development in recent years, they have contributed to the special intellectual character and environment of MIT. It is crucial to know that this development is inseparable from its funding structure. While RLE director Straton told his staff uh, that the RLE's military contract sets a pattern for the pr proper sort of relation between academic institution and sponsoring agency because the contract provided state fiscal support but permitted researchers' freedom to pursue basic research. In the words of Vannevar Bush, once dean of MIT School of Electrical Engineering and conceptual architect of the National Science Foundation, basic research is performed without thought of practical ends. It results in general knowledge and an understanding of nature and its laws. In short, the supplement to knowledge production that resulted from Cold War development of interdisciplinarity was conditioned by a supplement of funding that was meticulously negotiated to provide freedom of research interest. Realistically, while basic research into guided missile systems at the RLE in the late 40s may have required a high level of intellectual freedom, the larger military industrial academic interests are transparent. Similar funding structures supported in disciplinary arts projects such as Center Beam in 77-78, which was created by over 20 artists at MIT Center for Advanced Visual Studies, together with about 10 MIT scientists and engineers. Center Beam's funders included the United States Information Agency, National Science Foundation, and Alcoa. As Ali Upitus argues, this project, which replicates institutional research models, was interdisciplinary collaboration, not extradisciplinary critique. And perhaps I skip through Brian Holmes and, and Agamben and, and other names, <laughs> and just hand it over to Lameda. We arrived to a art, culture, and technology department or program at MIT, and uh, ourselves, we, of course, we are interested to look at the history, but also to find some kind of, you know, something what was not explored there. And apparently, we were very happy to find this uh, river file, uh, which was a project never realized, or like a collection of the projects which were never realized, also initiated by Kepesh. Uh, and in 1972, report to the president of MIT Corporation, Kepesh writes, I'm enclosing brief report on the work in progress that the CAVS covering the seven month period of, of activities. First, it was a major collaborative effort centering upon a large-scale environmental project. The objective of this work was to give a rich contemporary meaning to a river that interfaces a densely populated urban area. Besides the sky, a river is the only aspect of our urban environment that has not been parceled out into a real estate or butchered by human insensitivity and carelessness. It suggests far away places, places and distant memories that this gives us, the urban citizens, a most needed sense of freedom. The chosen project explored new artistic ways of revitalizing the role of the Charles River by giving it forms that, other pleasure, uh, that either pleasure or satisfying the citizens' emotional and symbolic needs. Uh, and this exploration uh, had five aspects. 
The first was the development and combination of, of long overdue pollution abandonment with forms, uh, which forms solutions that offer it a more intimate and richer visual connection with the river. The second aspect of the project sought to develop ways of utilizing water as an artistic medium by creating individual forms and events that could bring joyful focal points to the banks of the river and help to transform the river surroundings into a new kind of water park, a contemporary democratic Tivoli. Uh, the enclosed sketches and photographs of, of existing floating fountains, water playgrounds, and other hydraulic sculpture forms give some hints as to the possibilities. As every river that flows through a city has different morphological aspects ranging from almost rural, rural atmosphere to urban character, a group of co-workers searched for artistic solutions to reclaim nature's poetic resources by developing new kinds of nature parks on the banks of unpopulated areas of the river. Uh, the project focused on public attention to the neglected aesthetic and human significance of the Charles River in our urban life, thus contribute to a higher awareness of envir environmental values. Uh, another objective of that project is to make the larger scale environmental form an educator of sensibilities by presenting informal material and imaginative novel ways and with high aesthetic quality. That the third goal is to make the public an active participant in the educational setting and this deepen and intensify civic and artistic responses and help to develop a long overdue ecological consciousness. And the report goes on. Uh, these proposals, the never realized proposals, are at the core of Center of Advanced Visual Studies Archive at MIT constituting the collection of ideas scenarios for Charles River Project. And it was a major collaborative effort centered upon a large scale environmental project aiming, aiming to give rich contemporary meaning to a river that interfaces a densely populated urban area. Some proposed and never realized idea scenarios comprise the starting point for our research work grounded in their interest to render agencies that move toward the civic and environmental as, from the, uh, as forms that reson resonate and reflect Capish's ethics. Aiming to produce a proposal for an intervention on a civic scale, we started from examining the history of interventions to the Charles River, be the industrial, military, scientific, pedagogical, or artistic. And we were looking for projects that embrace the environmental and what was suggested by Kepesh as the civic dimension of art by grappling with speculative forms that try to question the contemporary democratic Tivoli. Partip participants would experience many audio, tactile, and rhythmical characteristics of water while keeping dry. Events such as swimming in pockets within the containers, sliding, jumping, relaxing, all would be accented by reverberating motion of the container. As individuals move on one area, this motion would reverberate throughout the entire container, thereby all participants sharing the movement of others. End of quote from Kepesh. So maybe I just quickly finish with the, uh, that archival file and switch to our response to that, our kind of homage, you could say, to the, to the file. In 2012, we were invited to Modern at Oxford uh, in, in, in UK, like just as an artist to continue our research with the river. And of course, this was River Thames uh, that was our playground. The same probably as, as uh, Kepesh wanted to play with River Charles in Boston. 
uh, of course, what was interesting for us was all the cultures around the river, but maybe those who, which were not like really uh, mainstream cultures, but more alternative ones. So I. So today we are exposed to the ecological catastrophe and collapse of ecosystems. Uh, <laughs> And thus, for the River Runs project, it is essential to model situations that could predict and envision survival uh, in the hypothetical water age. When thinking and articulating relationship with citizenship and audience, we are deploying notion of the model. Models help us to situate projects in the territory between the virtual and real. As the reality and virtuality are both is under continuous colonization of representation of politics, Model thinking could provide the temporary publicness. In river runs, the river is the transient space that is in movement, in flux, where language is being generated. Spatial narratives suggest there is a reciprocal relation, homeostatic, between the language and space that conditions it. Thus, is our research, thus our research starts with the inquiry into diversity of cultures that finds its habitat at the river. We are interested in meeting at the river and hearing stories that construct and conceive that river habitat, that, that space of river cultures. This interest leads us to understand non-conventional ways of inhabiting the river, but also voices of those whose professions are almost on the edge of extinction. Wild swimmers, narrow boat squatters, artist captains, venetial rowers, yulowers, and scientific scholars River archaeologists, crazy inventors of alternative transportation systems, self-made river historians and anarcho-environmentalists, lock keepers and swan keepers became a stakeholders of the river runs. That is the first audience that we discuss our project with. Like explorers who use rivers to get deeper into the heart of the continents, we explore river cultures so the project becomes an avenue for which we establish discussion and further contribute to the expansion of the discourse. The River Runs project investigates movement and artistic practice towards less tangible and more complex spaces of public-private contestation, spaces that challenge the notion of property itself. Developed as River Lab, a playground during residency at Modern Art Oxford in 2012, it explores how river and water as a public good operates to define our sense of belonging on an individual and collective scale. The work investigates and asks where and how public sphere, or perhaps more accurately publicness, can be constituted today and the role of artistic interventions in its production. During the residency, uh, we are researching river cultures that situate either life or research at, with, for, and on the river. On the basis of that research, we're developing a design for a variable device that would allow one to sense the environment and ultimately wear the river. Not only acoustical, but why the sensorial concern is addressed, including, uh, res including respects of body sense, sense of gravity, weight, motion, temperature. On the other hand, it is not only a perceptual, phenomenological device, but also a social playground where the public culture can be exercised. And I think we could scream for the images and show this last. Yes, I'm trying to VG with you.
like it's swallowing me. <laughs> it's really nice. It's yeah. like being in a hammock. It's really like a squeak. <laughs> Do you ever have those dreams where you're being swallowed by like a, a hole in the ground? <laughs> Questions. I know that when uh, when Bosworth designed MIT in the 1890s, um, in the original plan, the idea was to come to MIT through the Killian Court. Um, entrance um, through the river. And I know that through the work of Mark Jarzomek on the history of MIT um, architecture, and Mark Jarzomek, even in one presentation, he showed us this romanticized idea of entering the Institute of Technology by boat on the Charles River and entering it through the Killian Court. Was this folder that you found in the archives at MIT, did it include any information on the desire to go back to the original plan, or was it just uh, framed within the um, environmental discourses of the 1970s? Thank you. Well, that was, uh, that was Kepesius and, uh, and the fellows of the CBS. Uh, reaction to what they called this uh, cosmic, pro cosmic proportion of the environmental damage that was done uh, through the histories of uh, colonizing, abusing, polluting the river, right? So, so they were believing, as, as also artists uh, perhaps who came to, uh, in the, in the post-war situation to the United States, you know, they saw, they saw these kind of like developments occurring you know, in the post-war in American cities. And, uh, and they believe in this idea of, uh, uh, of humanism that can be realized through kind of like through the technologies. Um, so, so for them, you know, um, it wasn't that much uh, kind of like, you know, to incorporate these, these uh, planning projections, you know, uh, of MIT kind of like, you know, going from downtown Boston to to the other side of the river, you know, uh, but, but more to think how uh, different type of uh, what Kepesh 
proposed as Tivoli, right? How different type of uh, um, social and civic infrastructures could be could be kind of like you know imagined, right? In order to exercise, you know, to quote him, um, public cultures at the river, right? And um, and here it is of course interesting uh, interesting link uh, I think with Beterbiev as well, you know, who believes in this kind of like you know idea of uh, of civic infrastructure, right? But of course, there were some proposals to open up the the fence, which now kind of like separates the MIT campus from the river. Like even you know, if you you may know, what Harvard is also on the same in the same town, yeah. But it's like open. It has no even like you know big difference between the pathway next to the river and the river. Sometimes it's like really you know, both together, uh, and then MIT is like fenced, you know and it's really separated with the fans. So the, some of the proposals, of course, like, you know, really looked at that possibility to open up and here, for example, you know, maybe we could like see the, that Krynix proposal, which exactly is like, you know, opening up Killian Court and, and having direct access to the river, humanizing the campus. In uh, Finnegan's Wake, you don't really know if that is the opening word or just the middle of the entire history of mankind. And I was wondering whether uh, in your project of you know, bringing up uh, these uh, pastiche of uh, Oxfordian uh, river cultures, uh, you were somehow also trying to uh, intact or affect directly the university somehow bring them into the pastiche of the Thames. Well, uh, perhaps what, what was not mentioned, you know, that, uh, um, you know, like looking at this idea of spatial narrative, you know, like looking how the, how the design kind of, you know, or, or, or project, you know, for us in this case, you know, the design is perhaps, you know, a word that's, that is very implicated, you know, especially in the, in the territories of the architecture, right? Uh, but uh, uh, but for us, uh, in a way, impetus, you know, to think about uh, about let's say the environment that one could wear, you know, and in this case, the you know, one could wear the river, actually was coming from the fact that uh, we wanted to organize symposium, so-called wet symposium, where the speakers could uh, convene and converse in the river. And uh, one of the keynotes, uh, the expert of biomimicry, uh, was uh, hydrophobiac, right? So there are some people who are hydrophiliac, so whenever they see river, they want to jump in it. And I'm kind of one of these people. But, uh, but that person was hydrophobic, and we thought, you know, um, how to kind of like, you know, make a condition to enable that person, you know, to be in the river and not to get wet, you know, and not, not uh, so in a way, uh, this infrastructure reflects certain, you know, certain phobias and certain desires, you know, um, of all these different cultures, you know, uh, you know, like that that were mentioned, you know, uh, and cultures that maybe some uh, at the extinction, but also uh, ultimately thinking about this liminality of space. Uh, uh, river is um, also the space uh, that that runs in a different time. There is certain time that one should adjust their bodies and speech, um, and uh, and that perhaps you know was was kind of like you know another aspect of, of that project. I think there's a lot of um, uh, maybe if, if I understood your question correctly, maybe I misunderstood. But if I understood correctly, it, the, it's also the juxtaposition you know, of learned knowledges and lived knowledges, and some of these knowledges are very eccentric. And so the, the um, and, and, and I think it is a modernist problem, because how do you expand the, um, 
the, the understanding of what subject positions in knowledge are, you know, that, that don't, are not informed purely by kind of classical notions of learning, but different registers of lived experience and absolutely eccentric positions to the thing. I mean, that's always the most interesting, sort of developing, um, you know, somebody who's hydrophobic, whose subject matter is the study of rivers, produces a kind of schizoanalysis of, you know, the, the problematic at hand. And so it's, it's that, and when you do it at the, on the doorstep of an institution and a very, you know, elevated institution, that maybe sets the bar for certain kinds of, of classical explored knowledges. It's, I mean, it seems to me that that's what's sort of interesting about the notion of the river, is that it can bring, you know, in, in one space together these things, plus a whole set of histories of fleeing away, you know, of getting away, the, um, rather than the kind of centrist notion of the university. So I mean, maybe because you know, if, if if you work in Britain, then Oxford and Cambridge have very they occupy very defining positions. They're not just institutions; they define, you know, certain understandings of what an institution is, um, either in in negation or in in affirmation. But they they are defining. So the idea that you know, on their doorstep within their milieu are all these eccentric lived knowledges um, that kind of, of slide in and out. I, I, that's yeah. what I understood that you were that asking. That seems, that seems that so many of these beautiful, you know, handsome men rowing, you know, together all the time. Of course, I mean, our take on that was to look different, you know, cultures, natural. Yeah, exactly what Nomad is mentioning, that rivers through the histories were also used as public space to, for power exercise, or to exercise the power, right? For, for example, for the culture of rowing, right? Uh, so in this case, uh, it is interesting to see those other times, you know, happening at the same time, in fact, you know, those other cultures and those other voices that uh, that fall out of the regimes of control. That's what, what perhaps Capuchin uh, had in mind when he was uh, seeing rivers as unbutchered territories, right? As, as unparcelled, and un unbutchered, you know, like not chopped uh, into pieces uh, of, uh, of, of kind of like interest, right? Uh, not only that it's, it's, of course, today we have tools that can uh, measure, you know, uh, fluid objects as well, but, uh, and territories and matters, but, uh, but in a way uh, it is, uh, I would still argue that it is less controlled, you know, and you can see, you know, whenever you come, come to the river, you can witness that it is way much less controlled territory. So, which has... Trent and Oldfield is an urban activist who founded This Is Not A Gateway, which is a young critical urbanism project. And he jumped into the river to disrupt the Oxford-Cambridge boat race. And he was sentenced to, um, they, they found laws from the 1860s, which they kind of dredged up in order to sentence him to eight months imprisonment, deportation from the United Kingdom, etc., etc. So. I think the mechanisms of control that overlay the river and its traditions are actually quite solid, and um, and, and they're shored up, you know, by by rituals, and the rowing, you know, the regatta, the rowing, the the sort of, which are absolutely intrinsic to the culture of up, of really hegemonic institutions, and him jumping into the river, which could be seen as a a, you know, slightly silly um, gesture, was actually a disruption at the heart of, you know, power structures and hegemonic rituals connected to them here and raised um, unbelievable fury. You could not believe that a young man jumping into a river could create this level of disruption and um, that they would need to reach back a hundred and something years to find 
you know, the laws that would deal with him adequately. Right, so perhaps this ties back to this kind of like auxiliary uh, activism, you know, that, that Keller pro kind of like suggested. Mm -hmm. are channeling Kippish somehow or not or, or um, because in, on the, I mean, it, I'm having a hard time seeing he, he's, he's, he's so changeable in his um, character um, at times there is you know it's about kind of homeostasis and um, and feedback and so on in this kind of classic cybernetic script and then and then those drawings and Look like Lawrence Halperin. I mean, they look, they look, they're sort of, you know, they're sort of uh, uh, much more liberatory and messy, and they're not, they're not, I mean, I wondered if your project was a kind of a parody of, I don't know, guys, cybernetic dreams of perfect schools of people going in capsules, as one of your, as one of the of a, a renderings showed, you know, the sort of, you know, perfect little capsules shaped people, I mean, perfect uh, people shaped capsules moving perfectly together and you're kind of more lumpy, you know, um, uh, real people um, moving through. Well, uh, no, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, Kepesh is full of contradictions, you know, himself, he was, uh, you know, uh, amazing visionary, and uh, and and we know him from you know we know that those visions through his books, right? Uh, and and that that was kind of like uh, a point of, of departure in a way for us as well uh, to this to this um, to this project and this research. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if we look at his uh, work, you know his own work, you know for example Maybe. painting, you know. Most people know him as a student of Moholy Naji and uh, him doing photography. And uh, uh, but uh, but if you look at his painting, that was quite uh, surprising, uh, softly speaking. So um, so yeah, so it it is it is contra con contradiction. But at the same time, he, he is humanist, and uh, and what and 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 the project of CABS that he's launching is is being precisely launched in this moment of um, um, you know of, of what we what we kind of like try to understand and uh, you know as as more kind of like you know the time that that conditions uh, that conditions the. Um, the social and the civic, you know, this movement towards social and the civic that is uh, precisely in the, in the core of, of uh, also of the work of Jacqueline Tirith, I think. They, with uh, the invocation of uh, a solar eclipse. I hope that you still have a little bit of energy. We'd like to uh, somehow put on our proposition about turret and uh, maybe uh, the, of course it's not a sunset. The sun is not the object that is moving under the horizon. It's our interception uh, of our gazes on the surface of the planet, that it's our horizon that is moving above the sun. So the Earth is moving, obviously. And that is where the alliteration, this alliteration with plan the planet, somehow hides the deepest discordance of the two terms. The, on one side, to mark in place, to allocate, to determine, to delineate the processes for attaining, for holding on to something, even though it might be a river run. And its connections are, of course, to planting a tree uh, in Latin, to, or to establish a location on the ground and in space and in time. While on the opposite, the etymon of planet is the wanderer, the moving star, Aster Planetus. And in this rootless condition of the mobile star and the fixed notion of planning, we see a rise 
of the international in trying to bring the moving star into fixity, into that image of Apollo from the blue marble. You, know, you fix the moving star. You fix our planet that was mobilized by Galileo. And somehow, other things start moving. What was fixed before, planning, is suddenly on the move. It's suddenly mobilized. And this is where I think we would locate the complex trajectory of the rise of inter the international, or the global architecture. And Turret's uh, movement uh, for us is really in this making of this complex realignment, or double uh, mobilization, of, as it were. And, uh, our proposition would be that in order to grasp her moving towards a mobilization of planning, one has to somehow take into account the fact that we are making the world fixed in modernist terms, and we are bringing at the same time in movement the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene, which is formed, shaped by the great acceleration of which modernism is the hallmark, is now making the earth not moving, but moved, as uh, Bruno Latour says. It is now acting back on us. We spend so much time making it fixed and outside of us, and now it's completely uh, in reverse. But in that Reversal, there's a fragility, and this is where uh, our proposition is, that these conditions are extremely fragile. The gigantic project of Turret and her accomplices was fragile. We tend to see it as really enormous extension of institutions, enormous extensions of uh, you know, procedures and protocols and aspirations, but. Ultimately, it's an extremely fragile condition. And that coherence of, and fragility are, for us, the most important thing. So for us to plan the planet is to indicate, in as much emphasis as we can, the fragility of our institutions, which are exactly similar to the fragility of our superstructures or infrastructures. And this is where we would like to reposition Turret's work in indicating that it was really not just an issue of humanism, but it was the end of the possibilities of thinking the human as detached from the Earth. By attacking the Earth so much through notions of humanism, we ended up stranded, almost as uh, in your dry swimmers, mm. fixed, located, but in a completely different way than they were trying to fix things. The possibilities then are really to understand how the planet is the background of this modernist project. It is delineated as the grid of trajectories mainly of uh, moving trajectories of, you know, so that you can navigate the planet. But that entire rationality of possibility of navigating the planet somehow brings with it a very interesting for us connection with uh, not only the Cartesian extension of territories, but really with uh, an idea that is limiting our attachments to the land. And I would like to bring up a drawing, maybe if you can put it on the screen, that I'm pretty sure uh, Jacqueline Turret did, even though it appears in the book of Doxiadis, uh, Echistics, in, published in 1968. Can you put it on the screen? And it's, it's a double diagram that we've used uh, in our work on the Anthropocene in order to indicate the relationship between modernism uh, or planning and the conditions that are facing our inhabitation today. On the upper side, you see this very beautiful set of divergent lines, forces shaping human settlements. 
and there are moments when there's a straight line, other moments that line springs off in explosion and then comes back. And it, it is a timeline. It goes from past, present, future. And the present, it's scattered, splintered, everywhere. We don't know anything about the forces shaping our contemporary settlements. And beneath there's percentage of knowledge of human settlements, as if you would manage to somehow quantify knowledge. And it goes from 100% to 0%. And when there's stability, there's full knowledge. Then there's instability. Knowledge decreases somehow. You are uncertain, I guess. And then you have to gain back knowledge. And then it goes back. And somehow we are down there with very little knowledge. And this is 1968. And so we have to, of course, increase knowledge on human settlements, on human inhabitation of the planet, in order somehow to restabilize and, I guess, pacify ourselves with nature or with the forces shaping human settlements, which I understand at that time might be seen as the rising ecological crisis, overpopulation, the implications of modernity. The answer would be increased knowledge, hopefully 200%. At that time, it was considered down to a bare, I guess, 10, 20%. The proposition is that that force of modernism is exactly what is inverted when we see the earth being moved by us. It's no long, we're no longer in a situation where we can produce a movement of ourselves through more knowledge, but somehow more knowledge produces more reverberations, more unsettled conditions, more of modernism, more of the Anthropocene. So in that difficult situation is where we wanted to place this round table, which is round, round only in as much as uh, it is formed by tangents. You know, where re there's no center. There's no possibility of finding that center. It's, it's also very fascinating. I was thinking of the of all the rich actions that Ellen presented of what Turret did. She was a, a recorder, she was an editor, she was a note taker, a curator of exhibitions, she was an organizer of symposia, networker and a visualizer and all to in the background of, of creating things. And I was just thinking like uh, to be a, a student today you, you need to inhabit all of those spaces at once and many more of doing things. And somehow in, the, in, in, in Keller's presentation, something starts, and in your presentation, a river starts kind of acting back at us, right? So at some moment, even all the bureaucracy of the United Nations acts back on us. And all of these things that were um, uh, created, and it is in, it is that what, kind of this moment in time of being a student today of architecture or whatever discipline, it's something is acting on us of all of what we have spoken about today. So f for us, Turret's alterity, the um, fact that she was in the background, acting through the background, brings us to think that there's the leftovers, the uh, remainders uh, of that narrative are too quickly identified as such. What if Terry is not just a leftover of the big history of modernity? What if she's not the unwanted hero? What if she is not that element that manages to, cons to operate only by being at the margin? Uh, how can we think uh, of uh, knowledge production not as uh, conquering a center? How can we think of knowledge production and the construction of inhabited spaces as uh, in being in the middle of things? How can we imagine agency in the middle of so many fragile institutions where there is a problem with uh, a forgotten file, somebody uh, has just been fired, 
there's not enough budgets, there's a computer bug, there's a, a misunderstanding of what uh, an institution does, there's a mythology of modernity. What if we would start considering institutions in their fragility, in their uh, complexity, as the territories that are now being reshaped by our actions, rather than placing our interventions, uh, rather than placing our uh, attempts to locate architectural and urban interventions at specific scales, what if we simply understand that at every moment of amplification of uh, our knowledge, there are fragilities, there's cracks, there's incomprehensions, there's misunderstandings, there's um, probably even deep, deep bad judgments, and how to make them not just the remainder, no, what it is at the side of the major history. So this is where we wanted to somehow push the uh, project on Plan the Planet. No? The possibility not of modeling our actions so that the planet would somehow match our aspirations, but not even the other way around, not even the possibility of complete um, being in tune with uh, pacified nature, no, not even that notion of unifying ourselves with a harmonious social or natural condition, but rather to array the planet with very complex, difficult, you know, contrasted uh, moments of measurement, of uh, trying to measure very clearly and articulate how we measure, how we sit on the ground, how we are on the planet or on the river, and as the site of our practice. So, and this is where we think that the uh, instruments that somehow Jacqueline Turret started to explore in a very strange way in connection with the visions of uh, Geddes, both from the aerial view or the introspection of Geddes, somehow meets another set of observations and conditions that are not human any longer. They are maybe, to use the friends of many of our friends, inhuman or non-human or post-human conditions, algorithmic-based remote sensing, organization of uh, uh, extraction of resources through very complex procedures, you know, the software uh, of contemporary life. Which again, Terry Twering was very early on in contact with what we learned from Ellen again, with uh, seeing uh, X-ray and infrared detectors with, through Kepesh at MIT. Those were very early signs of what we today see as um, sensing through remote, remote devices. But the point is that all her attempts and all her peers' attempts to see, to mobilize vision, to articulate those maybe feedback loops were always aiming at the globe. They were always looking towards the higher picture, the world as one. They wanted always to, or oh, they hid their difficulty under that aspiration of one world, one rationality. And our proposition eventually would be that the opposite needs to be achieved. To bring it down, to articulate our territories, to articulate what keeps us alive, not through an aspiration to the larger condition, but really to say, this is my space. This is how I fight for it. This is where I would inquire into the difficulties of maintaining a life and institution, how that fragility uh, is not just gone in one day. Institutions can disappear overnight, as we very well know. But somehow to find in there somehow divestment uh, that is happening from all sides, not uh, impetus to make them more robust, more resilient, more, but somehow possibilities of uh, understanding what is at stake for these institutions, which is, we think, the difficult condition of planning the planet. We never know what is at stake from, for others, and that's where 
somehow we wanted to put the work on of Tirith. What was at stake for the background there? Was it to foreground others, or was it to articulate her collective uh, space of leadership? So this is, to put it simply, to plan the planet, to move the Aster Planetus, the moving star of Galileo, and make it a fixed image. The, the marble, the blue marble, means to mobilize planning. And that brings up all these conditions of separations, and divisions, articulation of very contested violences. Maybe what is at stake is to consider the background. And that's how we wanted to interpret it. Thank you. What makes you think that she made that one? Because I think that she was really uh, the, uh, the person who thought through uh, the work of Luxelius. Because he was known for those diagrams. Yeah, but that one is very strange. It's the only one that appears in the book, and it starts at the beginning and never appears again. And it's the only one that includes uh, those divergent forces. Usually in his sketches, especially the uh, Ecumenopolis sketches, there's no borders, there's no divisions, there's always an overarching, encompassing order. That one has clear borders. And maybe it's just a wish. Yeah, <laughs> it might be, because there are many, many people who might have made that, let's say, drawing of the orthodox eyes. But it's interesting that you saw her, and that's very interesting. Maybe it's just a wish. <laughs> well, just to follow up on that, um, are there any drawings of hers around? Like I mentioned, when she, um, she started off as a um, landscape um, designer, um, are there any of her projects um, in an archive or? Well, this is really, I'm not qualified in any sense to uh, say if they are around. The, I have seen many boxes in the archives that are now at the RIBA, at the VNA, <laughs> at the RIBA archives. But there are, there are a few copies of her maps, especially the, uh, the multi-layered maps in, that, in those boxes. And in the archives of uh, the AA, for sure, we didn't find much. But definitely, she was someone who innovated how we drew, how we saw the world, how we inhabited that space of vision. And many of her schemes are no. the foundation of our contemporary understanding of what it means to, to draw. Her pioneering work on uh, computers is clear. Well, the um, example from the, her uh, shapes of cities that can grow, where she derived this from Because she, she, uh, you showed us the aerial Im image of Europe that she had on the cover of one of her reports. Well, she didn't draw it. No, but she chose to have she it. Chose to have she, it. Cho she chose to have it, and she chose those things on many occasions, which was quite revolutionary at that time to see planning, like you explained. And um, she, if I understood right, she's also one of the people who started thinking of layering maps, right? Right in order to what actually gave rise to GIS, Geographical Information well, System. There were many feeders into GIS, and yeah. she's acknowledged by and people who have written the history of GIS as somebody who made that contribution. And she herself was building on a long tradition mm -hmm. of, of over, using overlays. And even within the planning profession, 
um, there are examples of that she was building on. But she took advantage of new mechanized production techniques right. in order to produce and mechanize this process in a way that was, became more standardized because the 1947 planning legislation for grid and required surveys had to be done as part of every plan. It mandated that every town had to have a, a plan in every town. Every plan had to be based on a survey. And all of a sudden, every town had to go out and commission surveys. And there needed to be a regular, a standardized way of doing the surveys and uh, a way of registering. Mm -hmm. But somehow, that standardized carried with it the nation. You know, in, in this beautiful image that you have in your book, which is called Cakes, Buns, and yes. Biscuits. And it's a way of uh, planning uh, the regional reorganization of uh, Britain in view of cookery customs. Right. And they, were, she was, they were inventing, they were saying, okay, how... You can how only do that do from a national state position. And uh, you know, as we learn from the amazing work of uh, Keller on being beneath the state or just above the state, to be outside the state, it's the contemporary condition where the state somehow still carries on this uh, idea of a land, or almost a Westphalian territory. It is now that territory, that statistical space, is now crossed by rivers that are highly polluted. When you look at the fish, you don't really know if it's a fish or the remnant of uh, a experiment in, in uh, very sophisticated uh, physics experiment, and so that is what is really uh, appealing to us, to look at how somehow Westphalian her idea of a territory would be. No, there it is, perceivable, understandable in its entirety. It's contiguous and continuous. Well, she was working within a tradition of, of British geographers. Mm -hmm. There's so no the pitfalls. Imagining the island nation, and you know, it, it has borders. <laughs> yeah, but the borders are now limits on all sides, and borders are scattered, and they become so much more violent in its in their definition. It's no longer just oh, this is my land. That is rather what we find impressive is the incredible well, that lack of imagination in thinking her. Uh, Territories. The those plan a lot of those plans of the nation were specifically made as <coughs> for the national plan because they were saying we need national planning. Of course, we need planning that on a regional basis. We need local planning, but that has to be within a national framework. Yeah, exactly. The answer is always following the question, but it's actually already implied in how they pose the question. We need a national plan. And there you come. And somehow being trapped in that institutional framework. Why was that being trapped? There had to it's be what it, for. Yeah, well, that's what we uh, find really interesting, no? that the impetus of mobilizing knowledge so quickly and unifying it so quickly showed us uh, an amazing capacity of these people to put forward this project. I'm saying this was an amazing success, but we're indicating that it was fragile. Were well, you saying it lacked imagination? Yeah, I think that you know, the idea of you know, extensive territories, really, a 16th century idea of boundaries and borders. No, the idea was to address uneven development and the fact that there were concentrations of poverty in the areas that had been left behind by industrialization and already de-industrialization, and that all the wealth was concentrated in the southeast corner of the nation, well, and that there was this conurbation, this, this, this one area where all the knowledge, all the wealth, all of the income, all of the jobs. And so you have to balance it. And that's what they were trying to do. Yeah, it's a balancing and good act. which is extremely powerful, and it has put forward all these policies that we've inhabited. Mm -hmm. it's, still, it's still the argument of the government that um, decides east, west, and south. Mm -hmm. 
is the, the, the financial center, it's, it's um, the, the sort of wealthy part. But I, I mean, it's, it's like the majority of politics around us um, is articulated in very arcane and outmoded sort of questions. So this is how politics articulates all set of questions about the conditions we live out, but it has almost nothing to do with the conditions that we live out, which are you know, globalized network, technologized in ways that local, the, the, the local division of resources or where, where there is wealth um, is, it explains absolutely nothing about the conditions of our lives. So I, I think, I mean, for me, part of, 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 and maybe that's for tomorrow, but part of, of kind of what's going on is there's this historical story that you tell, and I'm, you know, sort of faced with a set of conditions and, and um, questions that are of this moment, and how do I negotiate between the historical story and a set of questions that are articulated out of right now. And I think that in a way, one's not going to find that in the chronicles of a life, but maybe in trying to understand where the demands that that life fulfilled came from. How, do, how have those demands shifted in, in, you know, in the present constellation? Are, are we, I mean, I, I think one of the joys of working on a modernist subject is that the demands are really clear. You know, what needs to be done is very clear. For us, the demands are far less clear. It's, it's, it's much more difficult for us today to articulate a program, you know, or a set of, of, of demands, because they're multiple and contradictory and, and, um, and, and operate both in, in a material and in a, in a stratospheric way simultaneously. So it, it seems to me that there are questions that I want to ask now that have to transcend the specificities of a life, which have to do, but which maybe became obvious through the specificities of that life. So the, 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 the study, you know, the book that I read can lead me to ask a set of questions that are in the now and which have to do with how are 21st century demands articulated? What, what happened to the subject of modernism? The, the, um, let's say the subject of, of a postmodern era is not a reformed modernist subject. It's something completely different, but quite hard to put together. So for me, these are the questions that, that, that um, kind of emanate from this discussion. was to try to find a way out of the crisis of capitalism and to address social justice issues and to redistribute wealth. But to do it in a way that was going to not be totally revolutionary and disruptive of, it was gonna respect history and tradition, right. not degree but then zero. introduces yeah. major changes and um, introduce a, 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 a balance, the third way wasn't going to be communism. It was going to be this democratic socialism. And to do it, there had to be planning, because that was the only way of having an alternative to a laissez-faire method, which was what the, the government wanted. In your studies, you might have encountered something. You know, she practiced from Golden Square, which is next door. And on Golden Square lived John Minor Keynes. What was, what was going on there? I don't know, but she was more, her, the, the important connection was with the uh, group called PEP, mm -hmm. Political and Economic Planning, that Julian Huxley played an important role in, and um, they, like I had mentioned earlier, that there was this broad consensus that built around planning as being the third way, and they were trying to promote this, and this is what culminated in the labor government's victory in 1945, and they had a chance to institute. But the, the, ch 
challenge was how do you do it and you know um, maintain you know how can you how do you have planning with freedom planning for freedom that was the challenge and it's still the challenge and so it's basically we've had ever since then the retreat from planning which is the real issue and it's interesting that I plan the planet you keep talking about planning well <laughs> the you know the, there has been a major retreat from planning so to talk about planning the planet is like going back to this um, way of thinking from the 19th because I, I, I don't know what's brought it about, but the sort of, of how, how do you, uh, the, the sort of, of denoun denouncing the failures of a previous era is uninteresting because it's, it's all previous eras are failed eras. To a, to a certain extent, so it's it's kind of not an interesting exercise, and I think that um, and it, and it's partly a problem with modernism that modernism sort of produced a confrontational set of attitudes, right, against the old, against the traditional, and always always a notion of a breakage with something. So, what one of the things that we're really stuck with is the necessity to find another way of questioning the, the failures of the past that are not denouncing and that are not sort of, of, of sw that, that are not producing a position of complete contradiction, of sweeping away. And I, and I think it's one of the reasons that it's so hard to come after modernism because of the, the sort of, of absolute nature of the way in which an argument is set up. So you either, you, you have only two possibilities. One is negation, and the other is fragmentation. And we've opted for fragmentation, you know, for, 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 for dispersed selves, incoherent narratives, you know, multiple subject positions, um, and, and so on. But it seems to me that listening to this discussion, this is a quandary that we're in the middle of. I mean, we will be for a long time. We are uh, probably at the end of the graph of Doxiadis slash, slash turret, where everything is oscillating extremely fast. And everything is going on under our feet. I would like to ask everyone still in the room, still with energy, to thank everyone who has been participating in this roundtable, especially uh, Yeri Trogov, Kelly Sterling, Ellen Shoshkes, Kedemina, and Nomeda Urbonas for joining us in this fantastic uh, experience. And I wanted again to thank Ellen for writing this book, yeah. <laughs> which you can find in libraries next to you. Thank you. Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> 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 